I'm Professor Zucker, and I am one of the professors in the Business Law Department here at Cal State Northridge, and I'm also uh, one of the Gateway instructors. I'm also the author, primary author of the exam that you're going to take. So, what we're going to do today is I'll go through. Um, I guess I can't really pace that much because you're videotaping me. I'll go through a lot of stuff that I think you need to know for the exam, but also I, I'm hoping that a lot of you have already reviewed the material that you need to know for the law exam. I can tell you that the it, it, over the last two semesters, law has been an exam that people felt very comfortable with. People were able to um, uh, pass without too much difficulty, although not everyone has. It's also an exam that I think you could master pretty well, get a real high score, and perhaps offset um, another exam that, that you're not uh, perhaps doing as well on. Now, do you know where to get the material for the law uh, review uh, section of the exam? Okay, it's on the web. So if you go to the Gateway web page and go to Lower Division Core Review, it will bring you to a section on the business law material. And there are ten topics that we ask you to be familiar with. All right? They're, um, and we'll go through them today. But basically, there are contracts, offer and acceptance, torts, intentional torts, negligence, products liability, uh, statute of frauds, um, and a few, other, uh, a few other sections. The difference between a civil and a criminal case, a uh, section on damages and remedies, and uh, a couple other that don't come to mind mine quite yet, oh, uh, fraud, uh, uh, misrepresentation, that's pretty much it. I think there might be one or two others, but we'll go through them this morning. The neat thing about the law is that um, the people that put together that review section on the, on the web, first of all, it comes pretty much verbatim out of some of your texts. You know, if you use the Maller text for Business Law 1, that material, we've received permission from the publisher of Maller, the Maller text, Business Law and the Regulatory Environment, 11th edition, to, to take that material uh, out of there. From those web pages, from that material, we've written the questions. And I know that almost every question on this exam, you can find at least pretty much all of the information you need on the web page. So you really don't need to go to other materials if you don't, if you don't um, want to. All right, are there any questions so far before we get moving along? Yes, sir? If we did well on the uh, practice exam, we should be fine for the test. All right, the question is, what if you did well on the practice exam? Does that mean that you'll do well on the business law exam? I don't know, because the practice exam, what I did for that was there's a bank of however many questions, and I randomly asked the computer to pick 10, and one from each topic. So uh, it's, you know, I don't think uh, just by knowing those questions, you'll automatically get the others. And by the way, those 10 questions were removed from the bank after I did that. So you won't see those 10 questions on the exam. All right? Okay. First, let's talk about what an offer is. What an offer is. And we'll start off by, uh, let me ask uh, an offer. Um, if I, for example, place an ad in a newspaper, is that an offer? Okay, normally an ad, like you see, Fries, uh, Levitz, whatever you whatever you see. Normally, that's not an offer, but an invitation to negotiate, unless unless the um, the offer is so specific, like five cars at eighteen thousand dollars each, and that's 
considered specific enough that you can come in and simply accept that offer as long as there's five cars left. But if it's sofas at $399 each without specifying a quantity, that's probably not an offer. Okay, so think about it in those terms. If it's real, real specific, five cars at $18,000 each, that's probably enough to be considered an offer. That's sort of an exception to the rule that offers um, uh, uh, in advertisements are not, or, or advertisements are not considered offers. Um, when does an offer terminate? When does an offer terminate? I offer to sell you my car for uh, $15,000. When is that offer done? Well, what if I say I offer to sell you my car for $15,000 uh, good until the end of the day? Well, then the offer says it's good until the end of the day, and that's when it terminates at the end of the day. Um, what if um, uh, I just say I offer to sell you my car for, for $10,000 with no expiration on it? Well then it terminates after a reasonable time. What's a reasonable time? Well, on the test, we'd have to alert you to something that would indicate what a reasonable time would be. An offer to sell uh, a quantity of pineapples is probably going to terminate within a few days because the pineapples are going to expire, right? So you have to really think about what it is the offer is for. Um, <laughs> I offer to sell you a, uh, a 10,000 uh, pencils. Let's say I'm uh, uh, Office Depot and you're, um, uh, uh, you're a wholesaler. I'm sorry, you're, you're a wholesaler, I'm a retailer. I off, uh, you offer to sell me, Office Depot, um, 10,000 boxes of pencils for a dollar each. That's ten thousand um, dollars. Let's say the offer is signed, right? It's put in writing. It's signed, and it says it's going to be remain. It's going to remain open for let's say nine months. Um, does the offer terminate uh, after what period of time? Okay. The answer would be normally and. Even if I put something in the offer that says it's going to stay open for a period of time, normally that is not enough unless, unless it's for the sale of goods, it's offered by a merchant, it's put in writing, it's signed, and the most it could stay open is for three months, right? So you and I are just talking, and I offer to sell you my book or something, for $100, and I'll hold it open for a month, let's say. And then a couple of uh, weeks later, I revoke the offer. The question there is, do I, am I held to that month? Well, I'm not a merchant. I'm just selling you my book. So the answer is probably no. But in order to come into the exception of the merchant rule, I offer to sell you 10,000 boxes of pencils for a dollar each. Okay. If I'm in, and I'll hold that offer open for a period of time, let's say uh, four months, well, that may be okay as long as I sign it, as long as I'm a merchant, and you've got to go back and, and figure out what a merchant is under um, what we call the UCC, the commercial code. And as long as, again, it's signed, I'm a merchant, it's for the sale of goods, for the sale of goods, and... And the most it could be held open for is three months, 90 days. So if I say four months, that means, well, it can only stay open for 90 days. If I say two months, then it could be held open for two months. Okay? So make sure you know that section. Um, Okay, let's say, um, so just, just, let, me just ba let me just basically go back over offers and acceptance of offers real quick. An offer is where one person relates something either um, 
verbally or orally to another person, an offeror relates to an offeree, an intent to um, sell something or do something which allows the other person to accept. Okay? What is a, you, sh you should also know a couple other things. The difference between a bilateral contract and a unilateral contract, right? A bilateral contract is where I offer to do something for you or offer to do something if you, if you offer back or promise back to do something. For example, I promise to sell you my car for $1,000. If you promise now to buy it for $1,000, or I, I promise to give you my car if you promise to pay me at some point $1,000. That's considered a bilateral contract. All right? I offer to sell you my car for $1,000 without you promising back to pay me the thousand. That's a unilateral contract. Let me give you another example. Um, I'll give you five dollars if you today promise to mow my lawn. And if you, so, the, so if you promise right now to give me five dollars, I mean to, to mow my lawn in exchange for me promising to give you five dollars, that's considered a bilateral contract. On the other hand, what if I say to you, I will give you five dollars if you mow my lawn. I haven't asked for a promise back. That's considered a unilateral contract. Okay. <coughs> Put it another way: you're a contractor, and you're going to landscape my property. So you come over, and we talk about it, and we agree today that I will give you two thousand dollars at some point in the future if you, at some point in the future, agree to landscape my property. We've entered into a bilateral contract because we both pro a promise for a promise. On the other hand, if I say I will give you $2,000 to landscape my property and the other person says, all right, well, I'll have to think about it and I'll get back to you because I don't know if I have enough uh, people to help me with it. Well, there's been an offer for a unilateral contract because there's been no promise back to, um, to do the work. If he does the work at some point in the future, then that's considered a unilateral contract, if the offer is phrased that way. Okay, any questions so far? Yes? So it's all in the phrasing? Yeah, it's how you phrase it. Just think a promise for a return promise today. Bilateral. Bilateral. A promise for allowing you to perform later. No return promise. If there's no return promise in the wording, that's a unilateral contract. Um, remember, the offer is the master of his or her offer. So if the offeror says, um, this is how you have to accept it, I will sell you my property for $100,000, but the acceptance has to be in my office by 5 o'clock today, in writing, signed, given to me personally, then that's how you have to accept it. Otherwise, if you fax over an acceptance tomorrow morning, is that a, an acceptance? No. What is it? Okay. It's a new offer. It's a new offer. It's a rege it's the, 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 what happened to my offer? It expired, right? After 5 o'clock today, it expired. So tomorrow morning, by faxing me back an acceptance, what you've really done is, by referring to my offer, you said, I want to make you a new offer. Without saying it, you're basically saying, I'm making you a new offer, and here are the terms. Okay. So those are the kinds of things you need to know from offer and acceptance. Make sure you go over uh, the mailbox rule, because that may appear on your exam. Um, rewards, you should know that rewards are uh, considered, uh, are usually considered um, offers for unilateral contracts. I promise to give you $100 if you find my dog. Obviously you're not, you know, you see a sign that's not obligating you to find the dog, but if you happen to find the dog and you bring the dog, you've, you've basically performed. So you've, there's a promise to give you $100 if you find the dog and return it. Ah, you happen to see the dog, you bring it back, you've now accepted a offer for a unilateral contract. Okay, um, let's turn to intentional torts real quick. The, the main intentional torts that you need to know 
are assault, battery, false imprisonment, and I think that's it. Intentional affliction of emotional distress also. And let me go through those. Assault. Assault. What's this? Okay, you flinched. It's assault. Yeah, if she really thought, I mean, she probably knew. Well, I don't know. She didn't know. She doesn't know. <laughs> she, if, if she's, in, if she's in, in fear of an immediate harmful or offensive touching, that's an assault. Okay, you didn't flinch. <laughs> Why? Because you probably didn't think that, I mean, maybe if you were a little bit further back, you probably didn't think that I was going to throw a pen at you. Or even if I did, it wouldn't hit. Or what if you were 100 yards away, and I look, and I do this. You just stand there and kind of watch it. That's probably not an assault. Okay? You have to have, you have to be in immediate fear of a harmful or offensive touching. That's an assault. Okay, you're not looking, I just, you didn't even look. All of a sudden it hit you. What is that? Battery. It's a battery. Because he didn't see it coming, so it's probably not an assault because he had no fear. But even if it didn't hurt him, it would probably be offensive. For me to sit around throwing pens at you is probably offensive. That's a battery. A harmful, it's an intentional act by someone that's not privileged, that's not uh, allowed by the receiver. An intentional act that results in a harmful or offensive touching without the other person's consent and for one that isn't privileged. That's a battery. Now I could have assault and battery if you see it coming and it hits you. Or what if I take the pen and I mean to throw it at the person sitting in front and I miss, and the person behind her doesn't even, you know, looking away, writing her notes, and it hits her in the head. Okay, who, who, I've, I've committed a battery because, well, I might have committed assault against you because you probably might have thought that this was going to hit you. Right, so you might have been assaulted because you were in fear of a harmful offensive touching without your consent that's not privileged and it was intentionally done. But it didn't hit you, so there's no battery. Now, the person behind her was, you know, writing notes, and there was no, she didn't see it coming, but it hit her. Battery. It's also something we call um, the doctrine of transferred intent. So I might have tried to batter the person in the front, but I ended up battering the person behind her. It doesn't matter. Under the doctrine of transferred intent, I could end up battering someone else, and that's still a battery. Or, I mean, it can even work this way. What if I intended to assault you, but it pen slipped and it hit you? Well, I only intended an assault, ah, ah, but it slipped and I hit her. That would be a battery. So it not only transfers across targets, but it transfers across torques. So I intended to assault, but I ended up battering. All right? What if this were the only exit right over here? And I stood here. Let's pretend this is the only exit, and I say, no one's going anywhere. Okay, probably we might have the tort of false imprisonment. False imprisonment is an intentional act of me keeping you here without your consent, without a privilege. You have no reasonable means of escape, and it's for an appreciable amount of time. All these things have to be present. Now, since we really do have other exits, and I stand here, and I say, I'm not letting you go, well, you could just walk out the sides, or, out, or the back. Well, there's no false imprisonment, because you can get out. If, you, if, if someone said, oh, you know what, we could punch one of these things out in the top here, and crawl out, that's probably not a reasonable means of escape. So, assuming that those, there's no exits back there, this is the only one, and you have to crawl out the top, that's probably a false imprisonment. If I stand here for a second and then walk away, that's probably not enough time. Okay? What if, what if one of you, I witness one of you whack someone else in the head? And I decide, you know what, you're not going anywhere. 
um, you're going to stay right here, and I'm going to call the police. Well, maybe that's privilege, because I witnessed a crime, what I perceived to be a crime. So maybe in that case, I can keep you here against your will for a period of, for a reasonable amount of time, long enough to call the police and have them come and take over. And that's probably privilege. And you probably know that store detectives working for a merchant have usually have privilege to restrain someone for a reasonable amount of time against their will and to use a reasonable means of doing so. They can't hang them by their feet or something. All right. So think about all those things when you're thinking about the tort of false imprisonment. Usually what we're asking you is, you'll probably see a question that has to do with someone stealing or they think they're stealing. All right. Oh, and by the way, do they actually have to have stolen something in order for the privilege to be there? Nope. No. No. There just has to be reasonable cause to believe that you stole something or you did something wrong. And if after a reasonable amount of time it's determined, you know, I take you in the back and I you up your purse and I made a mistake, I apologize and let you go, then it's probably okay. You probably have a, a uh, the, the privilege still there. But if I say, oh, well, you know, you weren't being cooperative, so even though you didn't have anything there, you were a jerk, so I'm going to keep you here, you know, for a couple hours. In fact, Disneyland used to get in trouble because they had um, Disney Disneyland Jail, where they would, people would do something wrong and... This is in the 70s. They would, um, uh, it's usually kids. They'd put them in Disney jail in the security <laughs> office. And they would usually call the parents because they were usually playing around. At the, you know, these were Orange County kids. So they, you know, the parents would drop off in the morning and pick them up at the end of the day. <laughs> and I guess, it, I, was, I just remember reading an article that uh, they would tell the parents, hey, this is what he did, come pick him up, they come pick him up, and then they'd be back the next week doing the same thing. So they decided to punish them by keeping them there without their parents being notified until the end of the day. Well, that was considered false imprisonment uh, because they were there for a longer period of time against their will. They maybe had reasonable cause to take them out of the park and hold them for their parents or for the police, but to punish them was not, ex exceeded their privilege. Okay. Um, you understand that you can be held responsible criminally and civilly for the same thing, right? Make sure you understand that. I can take this pen and hit you, and you can sue me in small claims court, for example. And you can also go to campus police and file a complaint, and maybe I would actually have to answer to a criminal complaint. The classic cases are, are Martha Stewart, right? You know that she was indicted criminally. Uh, for the same conduct that she's being sued by the SEC civilly, right? Same with OJ. We had a criminal in a civil suit. So make sure you keep that in mind. We're going to test that. Know the different statutes of limitation. I'm sorry, know what a statute of limitation is. Um, the time which you have to file a lawsuit. You can have the most beautiful lawsuit in the world, but we have statutes of limitations that um, they're usually one, two, three, or four years. You don't need to know the different ones. We're not going to test you because they change anyway. We're not going to test you in, in this section on, or in this class on what they are. But you should know that you can have the most beautiful lawsuit in the world, but if you've blown the statute of limitations, you can't, I mean, it can be a valid contract, but you can't enforce it because of the statute. You should also know that some contracts have to be in writing to be enforceable. A contract that cannot, can be, that cannot be fully performed within a year has to be in writing. So you and I enter into an agreement where you're going to do work on my property for 18 months. And I will pay you a total of $10,000, let's say, let's say $18,000, $1,000 a month every month for 18 months. And at the, on the 18th month, you'll get the last installment. And on the 18th month, you'll have completed performance. Well, a contract that cannot be fully performed within a year has to be in writing in order for it to be enforceable, with a few exceptions. But you should know that's the first one. Another one is a 
contract that um, has to do with property. If I sell you my house, it has to be in writing to be enforceable. I could sell you my book for $100, and that doesn't have to be in writing. But if I sell you my car for $1,000, if I offer to sell you my car in exchange for $1,000, and I, I give you, uh, well, you and I, let me, let, me, let me give you an example. I offer to sell you my car if you promise to give me $1,000. And you say, great, sounds good. We've entered into a bilateral or unilateral contract. Bilateral. I promise to give you the car. You promise today to give me $1,000 at some point in the future. All right. Well, since it's a, a good, right, sales of goods, a good is something you can touch, like a car. It's not a service, right? I'm not selling you a service. I'm, selling, like, I'm not mowing your lawn. I'm selling you a tangible good. Since it's a good and it's over $500, under the Uniform Commercial Code, code that has to be in writing to be enforceable. So if, if I come back and say, here's the car, where's the thousand? And you say, well, I changed my mind. Do we have a breach? Well, maybe, but the question becomes, can that be enforced in court? And we have what we call a statute of frauds problem, because it probably should have been in writing to be enforceable. If I made the car $400, maybe we have a different story, because it's under 500. All right? So contract for the sale of goods over 500 has to be in writing to be enforceable. Contract for... Anything dealing with land, I'm selling you a house, has to be in writing to be enforceable. A contract that can't be completed in a year by its terms has to be in writing to be enforceable. And those are the main things we want you to know. By the way, I rent you my apartment for six months. Does that have to be in writing to be enforceable? No. No. The exception is that if it's a year or more, it has to be in writing. If I give you a one-year lease, that has to be in writing to be enforceable. So if we orally agree that you're going to live there for a year and I'm going to charge you 500 a month, after six months you want to move out, the question becomes, does that have to be in writing to be enforceable? Okay, there's a statute of frauds issue. Now let me just throw one other thing into the mix to think about. If there's been part performance or full performance, in other words, I give you my car and you've promised to give me the 1,000 but you didn't, since I've already delivered the car under the part performance rule, that may be an exception to the statute of frauds. So what you want to think about is, first of all, is this contract in writing? If it's not, does it have to be to be enforceable? Well, is it for, is it for uh, can it be performed in a year or more? Can it be performed in less than a year, really? The answer is no, then you think, well, we have a statute of frauds issue. If it's concerning land or leasing land for a year or more, or if it's for sale of, a sale of, of a good worth 500 or more, then you've got to think, okay, this is probably a statute of frauds issue. We have to see if it has to be in writing. Generally, it does, unless you have an exception like the part performance or full performance rule. Um, you'll have one or two questions on products liability. I'm not going to go into that because uh, there's a lot there and there's only one or two questions and I think the web does a better job explaining than I do since that's something that I, I don't know if I've ever taught it so I don't want to get into that because I normally don't teach uh, business law 280. But, um, so I'm going to skip that for now. If I have time, I'll go back to it. But it's going to take more time for me to explain it than for me to uh, go into it. Okay. This is the most, this is the best car I've ever seen. I'm the car salesman. I'm telling you that. And in turn, you buy it and you say, you know what, this is a, this is a piece of junk. Is that considered fraud or misrepresentation?